delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Martina Mashiach. Why why Pastor Hal in Chai squeeze uh Martino Hoshula with us in Wells? Uh in the Hulaus and I wish we can in a Latin. This is to say greetings, my name is Martina Hoshula. My given name is Kim Quelks, which is was given to me by my great grandfather, Ian Seymour, who was uh, an order, a storyteller, uh, uh, to pack on uh, oral paintings in our community amongst our people. And uh, found out by one of the elders in the language preservation program that this name that was given to him was actually his wife's name, my great grandmother, and which means uh, dress touches the ground. And so I carry that name very proudly. And I was, I was just so delighted to find out that, that it was an ancestral name that I was able to inherit. Um, I'm coming from the Arrow Lakes Nation of the Caldwell Reservation, and where um, actually we were, our Aboriginal territory was in Canada, and then we would come down and fish in the Kettle Falls, and that was for the salmon people. And then there was the, the territory was set up between Britain and the United States, and then. <coughs> All of a sudden, there was a border, and we got caught down below. So now we're on a call for reservation. And I just wanted to say that can live, can I like, can I I'm just saying that I'm very pleased to be here amongst all of you today. I'm a mother of six. My oldest is 28. My youngest uh, today is her birthday. She'll be 12 years old. I have four grandchildren, uh, two granddaughters and two grandsons, and they keep me. They keep me um, very busy. But they also. Uh, you know, when you think about your grandkids, all of a sudden there's this new worry that comes over you because they're just getting ready to enter into the education system. I have older kids that are, that are in college now and they're out of school, but all of a sudden I have these little people at home, you know, and they're just so beautiful and they're just so, uh, the energy and the discovery about life, you know, is so pleasurable to them. And I look at them and I think about where they're going and what the experience is going to be. And I had just gone through that six times with my other children. And I had gone through that myself in my own life in school. And so, I, you know, now I'm like, as a grandma, I'm like, oh my God, it's like damage control. What can I do to really minimize the damage that's going to happen with my, with my grandchildren? And even my daughter, who's, you know, just now entering into, you know, adolescence and the struggle that they go through biologically, but also psychologically. And then just coming from the reservation, and we live in Colbert, Washington, which is in the Mead District. And so, you know, I go to games, and my daughter's the only child of color in this whole team. And then she's already started to really feel bad about who she is, how she looks, her, you know, if she's fitting in, those kinds of things. And this is just, I mean, children are going through this all the time, but it's compounded for my children because they come from a whole different culture, a whole different reality. And I think that coming here to you today and becoming a part of and really being involved in a multi-ethnic think tank, I'm coming as a mother. Because what I realized, you know, in working on the reservation, and this, you know, this is this is what is so crazy about this whole thing, is that, that I'm coming and became involved uh, with the Native American Education Advisory Committee and with the Native American think tank as a mother coming from the reservation who had struggles in the reservation school. That you would think that a school that was on the reservation would be so uh, inclusive as far as the, the local culture and the community and the values and the history that's there. But it was so oppressive that when I went to school there in the 10th grade, that I, as a student, was trying to advocate for monies that were spent in the Title IV <coughs> Indian Education Program, that that money be able to be spent on be bringing people in, speakers that could model for me what it, what it means to be an adult, a Native American professional. And I had to fight the school district. I had to fight racism within the institution itself as a student. And eventually because of the reputation that I gained from teachers, you know, that they didn't want that, that I didn't finish school. And I dropped out in the 10th grade. And it wasn't until I was 18 years old and I was determined I was going to graduate. I had a son and a baby board, and I sat there taking the GED test because I was not going to. It was the shame that I felt of not finishing school and how so many of our kids face that same kind of shame. And then sitting in a doctoral class 
and feeling that same kind of shame as, as a professional and sitting in, 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 a, in a higher uh, institution of learning. And a man coming up to me and saying, well, you sure speak a lot about Indians and women. <laughs> and I instantly, I instantly introspected and I felt the shame. Like, oh, am I talking too much about it? Am I being hypersensitive about it? You know, what am I doing? Am I? And all of a sudden, it just like, I had this epiphany in that moment. I thought, that's all I know. I'm an Indian woman. That's my only point of reference. But somehow in that moment, the message to me that it wasn't okay. And that's when the shift happened for me. And that's when I was able to say to this man, you should speak a lot about white men from that one. <laughs> and that was so empowering for me. It was so empowering for me. It was then that I left that program and I didn't want to finish my doctorate because I thought, why? What's the point and who am I trying to prove to? And that's when I ended up in, in another doctoral program that was made just for tribal people around the world to study about the traditional knowledge of my own people. This is what we're looking at. When we're talking about what we come to, to the table, and this is what brought me to the Met, is that right now, my people stand to lose their language and their cultures. We're right there. We're at the 11th hour of losing that. And right now, my culture and the survival of my culture is in direct competition with the public education system. There are children that come to you in, from different cultural worldviews have to practice their culture outside of the school. That their own culture and history and values and stories and worldview is something that does not belong in the classroom. That's the message. And then we have our children that are failing. We're talking about the African American children. We're talking about Asian children and Hispanic and Indian children. And, and those of the low socioeconomic, that's a whole different culture that they're failing, we're wondering, why are they failing? And I'm saying, and I think what we're saying in the paper, it has nothing to do with their ability to learn. It has nothing to do with their intellect. It has everything to do with what the classroom is. It's about teaching them how to be white middle class Americans. And our children are failing in that way. That's what it's about. Their failure is not about their lack of ability and capabilities and intellect. It's about that they're failing to function in a white middle class culture and society. And that's the push in the classrooms. And what I'm suggesting is that we need to make a <coughs> radical paradigm shift, an educational paradigm shift that moves from an Eurocentric paradigm to one that is a multi-centric, that really begins to honor the uniqueness the unique needs of every child. I know the research is out there. We have all the talk about multiple intelligences. We have all the talk about learning styles, cooperative learning. We have all of the information. The research is there. But it needs to make it in the classroom. It needs to make it in there where this child receives the benefits of a teacher who can recognize the beautiful intelligence that this child has in interpersonal relationships. That that is just as valuable as a lineal mathematical science knowledge. That my child, that the teachers used to put him next to the most behavior problems because he just knew how to relate with them. But that was diminished, that was minimized. And he, in, on his ninth birthday, he asked to have a sweat. And the sweat lodge in our culture is the church. And my son went into that sweat and he prayed to do good in math. And it was in that time that I thought, that just blew me away that in the sweat lodge he's praying that he does better in math. Aside from all those problems we have in the world, he wants to pray about mathematics. And that's when I asked his teacher, from now on, when you grade his paper, put a smiley face on it. He doesn't know how, need to know how bad he's doing. You tell me that, I'll work with him. She had a hard time with that. She just couldn't put a smiley face on his paper and say, thank you for the work that you've done. Somehow she felt like he needed to know how bad he was doing, so he could work hard. And what I'm suggesting is that each one of those child that, children that come to you in a classroom that they teach us see, come with a wealth of knowledge from their own cultures. And that's what I'm suggesting here is a new epistemology, which brings in the wealth of knowledge of diverse ways of knowing from around the world, 
but I know that the knowledge that comes through my culture can be transformative, can help in that transforming and creating cultural and social change. And I know because I use this same knowledge in consulting with organizations and organizational change and transformation with my own traditional knowledge. Because my language is a language of the heart. And our culture teaches us about the sacredness of relationships. And that transforms the lateral violence that we find in our workplaces. That that knowledge is able to come through and help us in our healing, in our families and in our organizations. And when we look at what children are going through with this new anti-bullying and harassment laws, I'm suggesting that the traditional knowledge from my people can help if we can begin to utilize that and implement it and make it a part of the curriculum. And there's a, there's a gentleness and a, and a, and a, a nurturing uh, nature to what my culture can teach. And I know that from many other cultures. That the knowledge doesn't become a threat to the system, but that it becomes the opportunity to, to transform it. And that, that my child can feel good about who she is, or that, my, that I can feel safe about my grandchildren being in the system. I homeschool my son because I don't want him to be abused in that system because he feels really good about himself now. And I work with him in his math. And now math becomes a nurturing and a bonding experience rather than this assault on his, on his self-confidence. And the laws are here. I mean, we have already RCWs. We have WAC codes. We have policies that are in place right now that are saying that it is the paramount duty of this state it is the paramount duty of the state to make ample provision for the education of all children residing within its borders, without distinction or preference on account of race, color, caste, or sex. And we're also suggesting that this isn't just about children of color. This isn't just about children of diverse cultural communities. This is all children. And I, and I got that from a, lot of, uh, from a lot of white educators and community members. They're going, well, my child could benefit from this. And I said, exactly. How can we begin to address the unique needs of every child in the state? That's the real challenge. And there's so much that we can do that we can bring and we want to share. And now what we're suggesting as the Met is that we have a pool of expertise, of people that have been in those trenches, that have been in those isolated pockets. I've been in Indian education for over 25 years. I know what has worked. And I know what hasn't worked. And how can we begin to use that information to inform the system in a way that transforms it? And like Phil said, I too am very, very pleased to be here amongst all of you. I mean, this is so exciting. The last time that we did the presentation to WACD was a real, it was a, to me it was a real critical leap for us. And it was a paradigm shift. And it was just really exciting to see, because we expected to be a lot of resistance along the way. And all, this whole MET position paper has just, taken on a life of itself and has received an overwhelming support from so many people in the state of Washington and Phoenix. And so it's exciting. And we're happy and, and thrilled and, and feeling this, you know, this anticipation of how can then now we go to that next step. But I, I want to say that Einstein was the one that, that stated, and I just love it, because he said that you cannot solve a problem in the same paradigm that it was created from. And that's why we're suggesting, I mean, and when we talk paradigm, we mean that's a big shift. It's a radical shift. It's not reforming education. It's transforming it. And I just want to thank you for giving me your attention. And, um, and I'm just really happy to be reunited with my colleagues here in the group because it, it was a real journey. And it was a, and it, it was a profound healing journey for many of us in even going through this process. It wasn't easy, but it was sure worth it. So thank you. Our partner, Bob Plum. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to try to say uh, I feel honored to be here. I'm a substitute, actually. Uh, and in some ways, like any kind of rule is a substitute. Uh, I'm a Nordstrom man. Louder? I'm a Nordstrom man. And, uh, <laughs> and when I say that, I say that with humility. Uh, I think I was asked to be here. 
I think I was asked to be here because of the heritage experience. I'm uh, the assistant dean at Heritage College, and I'm proud to say one of the founders. Uh, we've been in business 20 years, uh, and our demographics haven't changed much. We're running around 90% uh, of our students are free and reduced lunch types, uh, and, uh, and on financial aid, 52% uh, of our students are Hispanic, uh, about 20% are Indian. Uh, uh, I think all of us are below the poverty level, for sure. Uh, but I want to tell you a story about generosity and poverty, if I may. When we started the college, we are, sort of rose from the ashes of the Holy Names College in Spokane. Most of you know that, I think. And uh, we went to the two branch campuses that the Sisters of the Holy Names had, one in Omat and one in Toppenish, and tried to close down the college because we were going broke, literally. And, uh, and both tribes said, no, it's impossible. You, you can't close the college down because otherwise we will not exist as college-educated people. And we said, well, there are 150 things that have to happen for a college to be, a new college to start. And, and they went out and did. But not only that, the first year we had no campus and we were teaching out of our trunks of our cars and uh, trying to find empty stores to work in. And uh, Pascal Sherman School out of OMAC, by five, six miles out of OMAC, and uh, <coughs> Colville Tribe. And Smart Lallet School, a new school out of Toppenish, uh, said, well, we don't have any money either, but move in. <laughs> and we did. We moved our classes in, we moved our, we, you, and they said, you can have our copy machines, you can have our secretary, share our coffee machine, share our secretary, share our phones, share our buildings, share our custodians, share everything we have. And for a year, we survived because of that generosity. That generosity came from poverty. It wasn't generosity from the rich down, it was generosity from the poor to the poor. And we tried to maintain that sort of spirit of, that sort of communal spirit of giving at Heritage College. I say that because, because I'm trying to explain uh, the, the moral issue here. And there's a very important moral issue, and some of you have read Paulo Freire and others, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, etc. And it seems to us that unless there's a clear connection in a child's mind, or a human being's mind, let me back up, a clear connection between their liberation, their growth towards liberation and learning, learning is not a relevant issue in their life. And that's what we've been trying to work on for the last 20 years, and I think we've made a difference in many people's lives. We also think that a society that maintains a permanent underclass is morally equivalent to a slave-owning society. A society that maintains and preserves a permanent underclass is equivalent to a slave-owning society. And that's why we think that this whole issue of lower class, which intersects every one of our groups, is so important that, that it can't be left out of the mix. The other intersection is gender and gender issues, and we don't, haven't really dealt with that perhaps adequately, but, but my point is, among us, if the persons in her tribe have a life expectancy of 58, and the people in West Valley, almost any town here, West Valley, have a life expectancy of 89, what does that tell you? Does that tell you there's some inferiority, or does that tell you there's some unfairness? You see where I'm coming from? I love stories, and I just told you a story, but I'm hoping that my colleagues here would uh, share it with this, because this is not an issue, this is an issue that intersects all of our groups. 
In fact, uh, in terms of correlation, uh, affects the groups and around here more than white groups. But I, but I wonder if any of you would like to add to this because it's such an important issue. It's the one thing that we all have in common here. Mm -hmm. It's not something. Mm -hmm. It will be added to as we go down the table. <laughs> it comes up beautifully and chimes in perfectly. <coughs> Thank you. Buenos días, Buenas tardes. Este, good afternoon. Actually, good morning. Still not afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm watching Andy go up. Elevate your voice. Okay. My name is Margaret Zavala, and uh, I was born in uh, the Yakima Valley, raised in the Columbia Basin, and am a survivor of the public education system. Um, I say survivor because truly, even though I did graduate from high school, and I did go on to the University of Washington right out of high school, I, I didn't feel like it was something that I had succeeded at. I knew that I had to give up a lot in order to do that. Um, it wasn't until recently, in fact, and I, and I was looking at the UW Seattle, it wasn't until recently that I really had felt that, um, that I'm able to be who I am and be able to share who I am in an educational program, and I'm actually a student of the Danforth program at the University of Washington right now. Um, and I think, but what it's, what it's done for me is it, it's made me very, very aware of my own experiences and my children's experiences and the lack of opportunity that I've had. And, and when we talk about the academic achievement gap, I look at the economic gap, the opportunity gap. And then I go back to who I was also when I was in high school and I thought I was real aware of the health care issues at that time. And that was at a time when there were no community health clinics and the one in top initially was before from the Yakima Valley. Uh, that was one of the first ones. And so I really saw this inequity in society. But I couldn't really pinpoint why. Why it was happening. And it wasn't until I actually um, began to have my own children and began to see <coughs> and really experience that it was about education mm -hmm. and that it was and that it wasn't it wasn't coincidental, I think that it was purposeful. Mm -hmm. You know. And then it's interesting because we sell we're celebrating Cinco de Mayo, which is not about, you know, uh, a six pack for four ninety nine <laughs> in the store. Um, but that, that, that actually, at our campuses throughout Washington anyway, it was a time when uh, students would get together to uh, be, able, be able to celebrate, once again, their survival on campuses. And that's how some of the mile celebrations began in, in Washington. So I look, I think, because this is the week that it's happening, I think the struggle goes on. And this has been decades later. And so, and I run into people that I see in the community, and, and it's the same people, many of them who have been working on community issues for decades now. And they're tired. And they're tired, and they've been working on it in individual grassroots organizations, in individual schools, in individual districts. And they've made you know, a little bit of a difference but it hasn't impacted the entire educational system. So even though some kids' needs are met, perhaps for a little bit, through a program or a categorical services that they're receiving, it hasn't impacted the entire population. And those of you who've been in the stores recently can just, I mean, you just feel the increase in diversity. It's there. Mm -hmm. And I really worry about that sense of belonging and as we talk about the changes in our society and the importance that, that there is in having citizens that are prepared and feel the sense of belonging in a democratic society, and I ask, we expect someone who feels like they've gotten the short end of the deal in school, who's, who experiences anger, 
because they are aware of it later on, to somehow be contributing participants in a democratic society. And I, which brings me to the paper, the position paper. Although technically it started four years ago, you know, when, when we were all called as a result of the low law school scores and Dr. Andy Griffin invited the educational community throughout the state to come and address the scores. It started a long time before then. And so when we came together though, what we did is we brought with us those experiences that we had, personal, community, and when we arrived, for the Hispanic think tank anyway, it was good to see everybody, but at the same time, it was the experience of coming together and mourning, because we knew that as educators, we all shared a piece of that responsibility. The, the numbers that were on the graphs that were being shown were people that we had worked in. We were a part, we are a part of the educational system. Okay. So, also looking at the numbers, you know, I, 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 I think about it and it really did feel like a funeral. Because with those numbers, in the faces of neighbors, godchildren, and most recently, our own children. So, so we had, you know, we knew, we knew that, the, that, that this is our community that many of us had been working for for decades, some of us recently. But this is our community that we're talking about, not, not surviving an educational system and not surviving in society. The picture's big. Um, when we, after we met with our individual think tanks, then what we did is we met with um, the entire group, and that was when the multi-ethnic think tank was formed. And the interesting thing here is once we began sharing, we started seeing a common thread, okay? There were some real similar things happening. And then we went back to share with our think tanks, individual think tanks, what some of those commonalities were, and just talked about those. Came back, we put together a plan, came back with a multi-ethnic think tank, shared the plan, and then in that process of sharing the plan, that we wanted to ensure that we looked at, at from every angle possible. So we uh, formed different types of groups with the multi-ethnic think tanks, the African American, Native American, uh, disadvantaged, and Pacific Islanders. And we broke up into groups where we had counselors, um, elementary, middle school, high school educators, and then another time we'd have people with all um, you know, just all elementary, all high school, all counselors, to, to see if, in fact, the issues and the problems and the concerns were similar. What were the differences? Okay. So we put that together, shared that, took it back, worked on a plan again, talked about maybe some strategies, and then brought it back to share with the entire group. And it was at that point, going back and forth through, these different, through this process that we said, aha, it's the same, you know, the issues are the same. We have a different way of sharing that. You know, we may emphasize different things because we all have a different history, but the issues are the same. And so that's when we decided to go ahead and, and, and write a position paper as a collective, you know, uh, idea. And so we began, um, so five writers from each of the think tanks were chosen, and then from those five writers they chose one um, one writer, so it was a committee of five writers with one writer, and that's the people that you see here. <laughs> the process of writing the paper was, was for me, um, you know, I mean, I thought, wow, 
know, all of us are, know our communities, all of us have been involved, we're here because we're concerned, and we're going to take the, the concerns, the issues of each of the ethnic things in the tank and put it, present it in the form of a paper. How hard can that be? That process was extremely hard. <laughs> it was extremely hard. Because what it made us do, it made us go underneath. It made us really examine some things, some things that had happened, that had happened to us personally that perhaps we had never shared. You know, sometimes it's a little bit embarrassing. Um, kind of, you know, I remember kind of thinking, God, I think I was like a little bit schizophrenic for a lot of my life. Okay, because I wanted to fit in, I wanted to belong, yet I belonged to also to, to my Mexican uh, community also. And so going back and forth and having to navigate, you know, and, and still somehow make it, those conversations came up. And then the, one of the things that came up too is, once again, when you look at historically where we are as a people, Someone else might have had a different experience. And so being able to share that, somehow getting our voice and coming to an agreement, because it had to be this collective effort in one paper. So going through that process, and I, I came to the realization that although I had always been involved in the community, it was my first multicultural experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm not 18, and I'm not 25, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am. But it was the very first time because I had had to listen in a way that I had never had to listen before. I had had to learn about the culture of other people in order to come up with a product, and in order to come up with a product that was going to impact many, many kids. After taking, after getting to this point where we finally got our paper done, and before we got that paper done, there there were many moments where we went, it went beyond probing each other. It went to it went to the point of really um, challenging challenging each other to explain why it is we wanted something articulated in a certain way in the paper. And there were tears, and there were uh, moments of joy when we got to that point where you know, we had reached a certain, a certain paragraph where it was okay, something we'd all agree on. And I, I also need to add here, too, the support of um, Andy and John, Roger Verdon, Denny, Baker, all of the people at OSPI, because in order to make this possible, they provided this environment that was conducive to our being able to go through this process, which brings back to the classroom. We, kids have to have that learning environment within which to, to be able to process, be, be able to learn, be able to express who they are. After having finished with that, then we took it to the um, to the multi-ethnic think tank group, and it was upon their approval that it was finally endorsed. Um, having had this paper endorsed was symbolic in many, many ways. One is it, it was a finished product, but most importantly, it was the first time, as been said here, that we had come together as a community. And we finally had a tool that we did not and would not, we, we talked a lot about this, would not accept having it just sit on a shelf. Because it had been done. Plans had been written. Uh, projects had been defined. And, and they've sat. And this time we were determined, and we are determined, as, as a multi-ethnic think tank, to ensure that it goes beyond <coughs> I had planned to sit and deliver this, but I realized I couldn't see some of the people in the back. So, um, 
Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Ang pangalan ko ay ni Bethany Gardy Bustillo. Good morning to you all. And my name is Mibet Gardy Bustillo. And um, it's interesting that I should greet you in Tagalog because actually I was born in Sion. And, um, but in the uh, process of the acculturation here in the United States, I lost two languages. And uh, my first being Sion in Tagalog, Actually, I've lost that as well, although I can still get away with some greetings, which I just did with you today. But before I go back over my background, I want to take time to thank some of the people that have really made this possible for us to deliver this message, which we, we give as often as we can to the people who care and the people who need to care. So I'm going to take the time to thank some individuals. First of all, I want to thank you all for being here. The work that you do in assessing pedagogy so critical. I mean, to see how teachers are teaching in the real world and they're being inclusive and is it really for all children, I think that is phenomenal work. I think it's going to require some changes in the way you see things. And perhaps because you're already here, that work is so much more possible for you than so many others. So I want to thank you for being here. I also want to thank Seattle University for being such a great partner for this work and for our ongoing advocacy and OSPI um, for their leadership, particularly on the Griffin's leadership. And this outreach staff, and I'm going to take the time to name these individuals because we really couldn't be here without their help. I'm going to thank John Pope, uh, actually we thank John Pope, <laughs> Roger Barone, Jen Hurtado, Paul Hamilton, having been to St. Peter, Joan Banker, Cam Bridges, and others. That, and I apologize if I cannot mention you. I also want to thank my colleagues and my friends and my sisters and brother <laughs> for working all these many, well, it's not, it feels like years now. <laughs> I think it's been over a year and a half. <laughs> and Dr. Thelma Jackson, I'm um, Joshua, um, Dr. Plum, Dixie Husser is in here, of course, but he, um, she has been working with us. And um, also my friend, Norma Zidala. I want to thank them for their commitment, for their time. Um, a lot of this work was volunteer before. And uh, it's just really amazing how much energy and talent is on the end of the day. A little bit about my background. Um, most recently, I was the former executive director for the Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs. And we had four um, focus areas. And the one that I really was passionate about was um, equity in education, put simply. And I don't want anyone to misjudge what <laughs> equity in education also means excellence in education. Mm -hmm. Um, before then, I was a policy analyst for um, the legislature and I worked in higher education and uh, capital budgets and school construction and that sort of stuff. And uh, before that, I was with Microsoft as a contractor, did uh, on site consultation there in educational technology. And um, I, I got my uh, public administration, my master's public administration degree in UW. Concentration concentrated in education social policy, particularly in the implementation of the education reform in Washington and, and its challenges and how it would possibly fail if certain things didn't come to bear, like the public support, for example, or awareness of what the work is. And um, some of the so-called standards and um, what that may mean for certain populations. And uh, before then I was um, backtrack a little bit in my history. Um, I was born in the Philippines. I came when I was 11 years old. And and I went through the education system here and forward a little bit and I went to um, the UW and this is not the fault of UW. In fact, I, I feel like in some cases the university helped me think, see things in many ways. I had to undo a lot of the things I learned in the last few years. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I had to undo those things <laughs> until I got to certain classes, um, particularly Asian, Pacific, uh, Asian American Studies, and it included Pacific Islander Studies, but Asian American <coughs> Studies. And this was the pivotal turning point for me, AAS 205. That was the first time I learned about Asian American history. And it was also the first time I learned there was such a thing called the Philippine-American War. And I was 22 years old at that time. I was 
born in the Philippines, and when I, you know, was there, we were taught that the Americans came, liberated us, and all this. And then, at 22 years old, I found out that we wanted our independence. We fought for independence. History will talk about the rangers of how many people died, but half a million people died in the fight for their independence. And I felt betrayed that that part of my history was not taught to me. My world exploded at that very moment. I went home to my parents and I said, I am leaving this country. <laughs> How could they lie to me all these years? How could they not tell us about the first imperialistic act in the United States in a formal fashion? How could they not tell me that? My parents said, well, this is your home. You're going out to decide whether it will continue to be your home. It took me many years to figure that out, and I decided this is, this is my home. And so I changed my degree from economics business to comparative history of ideas at the university to look at the way, how, the way different people see, construct the reality, anthropology, religion, you know, policy, history, that sort of thing. And ever since, I've been working on the reconstruction, the reframing of what I understood to be true. Because so many years, I understood what was true. And I, it started to unravel was not true. So I had to learn a question a lot. And I couldn't, in a way, really blame my teachers because they didn't know. They didn't know. So who could I blame? I couldn't blame anybody because this, maybe, you know, the institutions could prepare teachers better, but maybe they, was they were beginning to know, or maybe I could blame the leadership. I don't really know. So I decided to take certain things on my own. You know, it wasn't on my own, but to take that as a personal, um, lifelong work for me. We take the time to share with you our personal history and our, the process of the paper and contextualizing this whole experience for us because we want to introduce a frame of reference for you. When you go in that classroom, when you go and assess the teachers, when you go and, and see if this is for all students, are, are students learning what they need to learn in an inclusive manner or in a real world, we want you to know that for some students for hundreds of years probably, at least in this country, their frame of reference was not part of the dialogue, was not part of the planning, I ask you today, what kind of world do we have today? How did we get here? It's really interesting to me, linguistics is really interesting to me. When you say all students can learn, why are we even saying that? All students can learn? Isn't that an interesting statement? That we even have to note that and by all italicized both can underline italicized. Why are we even saying that? Leave no child behind. What is that saying? It's saying children have been left behind. We're emphasizing that because of what it isn't saying. Children have been left behind. I'm 35, and I think this work relatively is new to me. But I understand this work, this, this discussion has been going on for decades. I don't want to see and hear this discussion at this level when I have children. I don't want to have to go through the pain and the damage control and, and the deprocessing and the reconstruction of what my children learn. The onus is in many ways upon you. I don't want to put that kind of burden on you, but it is. You know, you're, you're part of the work is so important. So uh, a week ago, I went to a, um, a talk, uh, a lecture by uh, Dr. Ronald Kaki. You may be familiar with his work. Yeah, interestingly enough, he was um, the one who started African American Studies at UC Berkeley. Very interesting man. And um, he's written many books on Asian American history, and, and it's used as references a lot. And invite you to read some of his work if you haven't. And he says among the values of multiculturalism is that we become responsible for each other. And I might add, we become mutually interested in each other, in each other's success. Mm -hmm. There are also other values of diversity that I'd like to share with you, and I've heard this among many wisdomful people. There are, there are probably many, but I'm going to bring three. One is social harmony. 
The second is democratic strength. A third is economic integrity and sustainability. We talk about embracing diversity. Why? We do that. It's a good thing to do. I would add that some of those three things, those three things I said, among others, are important and among the values of the person. In this country, we have in the back of our dollar bills what an interesting Latin term, equal robus unum, out of many one. And in writing this paper, <coughs> and if we could have written in many languages, we would have. But in terms of practicality, we, we wrote it in English. And in many ways, our languages are there, but one out of many languages, one voice. Mm -hmm. We want to emphasize that. And out of many cultural and economic backgrounds, one vision, equitable and culturally competent education for all of our students. <coughs>